coming, and I hope you enjoy yourself today. A um, few things I want to talk about before I get going. I tell you what, I, I've got a friend of mine driving a truck out there at West and picks up feeding, and he knows some people out in that country. And I'm going to tell you what, that was a really horrible explosion out in that plant. It killed 35 or 40 people and injured just a bunch. And, uh, and we've had another thing up there in Boston. You know, we need to really, in our 8 o'clock prayer in the evening, if you guys, re you guys really need to pray over those people because they've got a lot of things going on. Truly, really a lot of injured people, lost limbs, and, and uh, you know, it's, it's a real bad thing. Um, <clears throat> uh, one, one more thing I want to mention before I get started. Uh, a lot of people have asked me about membership class, and we do have one today. We have one every, every third Sunday. And... And they want to know what it's about. Uh, membership class is just to really let you know what Cowboy Church is about and what we're doing here. Uh, the, just a couple of the major things that we do is uh, in this in this uh, ministry in this movement is to tear down barriers that in this ministry that, that other denominations and type of things that, that they have that people uh, don't feel comfortable with. Maybe something that, that they they don't they don't understand. You know, my, my way of thinking, what drew me to this ministry to start with was that God accepts everybody, no matter where you come from, who you are, how you dress, where you work, what you drive. It doesn't matter. And and that's where that's that's why I think a lot of love is felt here. People sit to me, they feel the Holy Spirit. It's because you know God is come as you are. You know, if you read the Bible any at all, you can keep you know this is. He, he picked his disciples out of a bunch of guys just like us. People that were just working, hard-working people, you know. And he, he was a carpenter. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't a Pharisee. He was a carpenter. So where I'm going with this, guys, is that it just, it just lets you know where we're going and how we operate off teams and that type of stuff. It's, it's really not a big deal. Some people are kind of scared to go to it. But if you come to a membership class, you don't have to become a member. If you want to come in there and listen to it, we'll give you guys some the paperwork that explains all that, and you go home and pray about it or whatever you want to do with it. But, uh, you know, if, if you'd like to come to it, you're sure welcome. It's right after this. It's about 20-minute 20, 20 class, 25-minute class, and uh, I don't give you a shot or anything at all, so it's, it's, it's pretty good. Okay, today, uh, I got to thinking about perfection uh, this week, and I talked to a lot of people every day that they fight that. They fight that in their life. They fight perfection. They want the best they can do in their life. And, and you know, you find, I found out through the years that the people that, that don't try to be as perfect are the people that win in life at well, whatever they do. They, they, they're the people that can fly by the seat of their pants. You know, they're, they're the guy that whatever they give them, they can go with it. And, and there's so many people that, that they try to find in their, in their, in their brain and they try to find confidence in their perfection in their life. And there's all of us have perfection in our life at certain points. But we're, we try to find that and get that all the time. And it says in the Bible that this is never going to be a perfect world. And, and the concept of being perfect, you know, is it, defined as finding a total completeness and a total flawlessness. And there's no fault and no default. We, we don't, you know, to find perfect perfection, we think we ought to have all these things in our mind. And, and we want to find it in our kids, we want to find it in our family. You know, if we, want, if we buy a horse or we do anything, we want to find that perfection. We're constantly hunting that perfection in our life and our jobs and everything. And it's been years ago, but I taught, I mean I taught, I coached City League Baseball there in town. And, and uh, well, you get education, you know, teaching City League Baseball. And... Um, the biggest thing was these parents, you know, the kids weren't much of a hassle, it was the parents. You know, I don't want to step on anybody's toes, you know, you might think your kid's the best, but everybody thinks their kid is the best. And they come up there and they tell me, they, you know, their, their kid, you know, he's, you know he's, he's perfect. You know, more or less, my kid's perfect. You need to play him as pitcher. The pitching deal was the main thing. You got 10, 10 parents want their kids to be pitchers. And, you know, and this one lady kept on, kept on, and, I, and, and I'm the type of person I wasn't like them with the coaches. I wasn't a winning freak. I didn't want to win every game. I wanted every kid to play. Well, I didn't care if, you know, little Johnny weighed 52 pounds. He was still going to play. I wasn't going to make kids sit the bench. 
her parents would get upset because their kid wouldn't get played enough. Finally, I just I got three or four of them together and I said, look, this is during the middle of a game and it stopped the game. <laughs> parents come up there and I'm, I said, hey, look, let's go over here and talk. And I said, I said, I tell you what, your kid's not perfect and you're not perfect. I'm playing every kid on this team, no matter what you think, and I don't want to hear anything else about it. Boy, they, man, they just turned around, you know, and they left. And I never did hear anything else about it. We got it all out of play. But you know what? Everybody wants perfection in their life. Their parent, and, you know, we're not perfect, but we want to provide some kind of perfection for our kids in our life. In an imperfect world, it cannot happen. It won't happen. Only one perfect one ever walked the face of the earth, and that was Jesus Christ. None of us will ever be perfect. And that's the biggest burden on a lot of people is they're trying to find this perfect, perfect thing. And the, and the goal in people's life a lot of times is the perfection that's in the imperfect world. God can never work in your life fully if you're constantly hunting that perfection. God promises two things, and two things to us in the Bible that is perfect. He promises that there will be a flawless heaven and one flawless being ever walked the earth. That's all he can promise is the flawless. And there's something else here that people just don't like to hear. That God doesn't care about your perfection. Doesn't care a bit about it. Somehow or another people think that they can be perfect. They relate it back to sin. If I'm perfect, I'm not a sinner. That makes no sense. Because if, there's no, if, if we're in a world of imperfection, how can perfection be sinless? It's never that way, guys. And everything we do, I'm the biggest sinner in here. Every day we sin, all, everybody is a sinner. I want to get that clear before I go on with this thing. There is no perfection that would cause to, be, to make you be sinless. There's none. And part of the story is this, guys, that in all the fight and all the suffering, the making, the pushing, the pulling, the arguing, and trying to work towards your profession, there is none. I can't, I can't name one thing that can't be perfect here. And in Philippians, Paul says this, not that I have, not that I already obtained all of this or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that which Jesus Christ told has held for me. Forgetting what is behind me, straining towards to be ahead, I press on towards the goal for the prize that God has called me heavenward into Jesus Christ. God calls you heavenward to a perfect life with him. We cannot furnish perfect life in no other way. The thing is, guys, that perfection... Paul says that if we don't, you know, if, if we're not getting it, you're doing something wrong. If you're trying to be perfect every day in your life, you're doing something wrong. Because if you're following God, God, you know, there's no way we can understand His plan. So in that way, there's no way we can reach perfection. That was ruined a long time ago back in the Garden of Eden. Man and a woman destroyed it for the eternity of man. Some people even curse themselves by trying to, to, put, to put their perfection first. I've got a friend of mine named Al, and Al is, 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 a, is a perfectionist freak. He wears me out. Everything he does, he's got 60 acres, it looks like a golf course. Man, that baby, I mean, that grass is... He keeps all of his horses in the stall. He's got 60 acres of grass, never turns his horse out on the grass. And man, I, for, for a long time, I, his horses look depressed. They're standing in the dark. <laughs> he never turns them out on the grass. And I kept staying on the grass. Man, all this place, you know, won't you turn your horses out? I mean, horses are dull looking. They get out. They just, they just kind of got their ears back all the time. They just look mean. Because I tell you what, if you don't get that vitamin A out of the sun, man, you're going to get mean. Well, he went to a roping one night, and he got bucked off twice. And he called back and told me, he said, man, I'm going to try that turning the horse out thing. <laughs> and it's like two years later after I've been on him the whole time. Well, he turned out his horse, and he's got a little tire store, and I stopped in his tire store one day, and I said, I said uh, well, how's the horse turn out deal going? He said, well, he said, I'm going to tell you the truth about that, man. I'm, I'm going to be, I'm convicted. I'm going to, I'm going to admit my sin today. I said, what's up? He said, well, he said, I loved every morning to drink my coffee and look at that perfect pasture. Said, I didn't want to see no horse lines in it, no horse poop. 
He said, I didn't want to see that. He said, you know what? I was. I was, I was, I was depriving them horses, wasn't I? I said, yeah, you were. I said, you need to get off that. You, I said, you were being a grass worshiper. I said, you, you, were, you were putting grass before God. He said, a grass worshiper? He said, you're full of it. I said, no, man, that's what you were, a grass worshiper. Putting something before God like that, guys, you cursed yourself. You put yourself in a bind all the time when you try to make things perfect. There's no way that we can keep things perfect. And the problem is that most people, that they think they're doing right in their own eyes by trying to be perfect, being, being a perfected person and being, letting their kids, making their kids be perfected, putting perfection in everything they do in their work. And pretty soon the most perfect, professional person, is that a word professional? I guess it is. A professional person ends up being the most worst liked person. Because all the people around you, you don't, you, don't, you don't care what else it takes. You don't care what it takes to be a perfectionist. Everybody get out of my way. I'm a perfectionist. I worked for them guys before, man. They'll drive you crazy. And later on in life, a lot of times, them people are not satisfied in their life because they can't find it. They'll drive everybody else away from them. They're not fun to be around. It's a very basic thing. The idea that God wants to give us is to do whatever you can for the kingdom and knowing that your walk with the Lord is what he wants you to do. That's all the perfection in the world is calling on him. And a lot of times, you know, we get overwhelmed and it's okay, guys. You know what? You're here today because you're here to see yourself move forward, and you, you want to know what God's doing. You want to know how God can move in your life. That's what you're doing here today. That's okay. You'll never be perfect in it. And we want to be perfect in it. I want to be more perfect in it. I want to serve the Lord in a big way all the time. You know what, though? I've come to the conclusion not that as long as I seek Him and do what I can in my life, that's all it's about. He'll never put anything more on me than I can handle. And said, his yoke is easy. And I try, to, I try to seek that easy yoke every day. It's not a hard thing. Three things that Paul tells us to remember is don't think you were up there ever in perfection. Don't let perfection hold you back from what Jesus can do in your life. Number two is forget the past, guys. You can't go back and redo it. You can't find perfection. You can't make perfection out of what you learned in the past a lot of times because there is no perfection. Move on from where you're at. Love the Lord where you're at. Don't be somebody you're not and don't try to be more than you are. God doesn't want that. Be all that you can be through Him only. And here's the biggie. What Paul says is to press on toward the goal. You know what pressing on toward the goal means? Sacrifice as you go along. Sacrifice all the stuff that you thought you could perfect back to Jesus Christ. And we all stress that about our faults. Man, we all got something wrong with us. Maybe we don't want to admit it, you know, but all of us got something wrong with us. I mean, I mean I'm going to tell you what, for a long time, you try it as you, as you grow up and before you really know Christ. I talked to a lot of people in my life, their faults in their life that they kept trying to perfect and make right. You can't never make them right. You know what? God can use the worst faults in your life towards the glory for Him. That's a predestination. That's what I call that. If you can't get rid of it and you're giving it to God, God's going to use it. Paul says this in Philippians 11. He says, I have learned to be content either way. It doesn't matter what direction God sent me. I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I can do everything through him that gives me strength. In uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 7, it says, to keep, me, <clears throat> to, to keep me from coming conceited, because of the passingly great revelations, there has been given a thorn in my flesh. Three times, three times Paul asked for the Lord to remove that thorn from his side. You know what? He left it in there. 
The Lord told him, he said, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. Perfect. Perfection in weakness. Perfection in fault. Perfection in everything in this world that is, flawed, that is, that is a fault. God will find perfection in the worst things in your life. There was a young lady that, um, she's a little bit older. I say young lady, she's an older lady now. Well, I'm an older guy, I can't say. I don't know. When well, you're 50 years old, who's older and who's younger? You know what I mean? Um, 51. Okay, I won't cheat. Um, anyway, this lady that I know, she when she was younger, she was a high school champion she, in the barrel racing. She was a college champion in the barrel racing. And <clears throat> for years, she bought horses and horses and horses. And, and I, she never could win anything after she left college. And when she was somebody in the horse world, she had a horse named Jack. And old Jack finally got old and died. Well, she grew older. She wanted that back. She wanted to win again. She wanted to get out there and beat him again. And she tried her whole life to find a horse that she'd beat him on. And one day I was over there and we got to talking about it. She frustrated. She had a horse colic and she had a horse crippled there. And she got frustrated. We got to talking about the Lord and she just broke down. And she worked. She spent everything she had. She, she had spent her whole life trying to get back with Jack Giver. But you know what? She wound up 60 years old with nothing. Because sometimes I want to tell you what, when you have those perfected times in your life, that might be it. You might as well enjoy them. You may never get them back again. Don't chase them trying to make it happen again because the Lord says that everything in your life is for a season or a time. It's not forever. Just enjoy them when they come. She never, ever was happy again. Still not happy today. She couldn't understand why she couldn't have that back. I want my fast horse back. Can't have it. The Lord doesn't give you to you when you beg for it and try to find perfection in yourself. You've got to give it to him and walk off. Lay it right there at the bottom of that cross and walk off from it and leave it with him. Let him handle it. Because he's the only perfect thing in your life you'll ever find. Don't ever let perfection alter your life. And I say that because people need to quit taking inventory of their life. Every day they take inventory of their life and they try to make their life better. They just inventory things. We all do it. We all catch ourselves doing it, trying to get better. And we need to quit, we need to quit pressuring people to be better. I mean, I mean not to, to be better, to be perfect. You know, God wants you to be better. It's okay to do better. It's okay to have more. It's okay to better yourself. But God doesn't want you to make it first. He doesn't want you to try to perfect it. He can perfect it. In 2 Corinthians 12, 9, Paul said, By the grace of God, I am who I am. You are who you are. It is what it is. All of you are here today to worship the Lord. And, in, and, you know, you, you come here, I come here as an imperfected person. And I, I try to prepare myself for this because I stand humble before God every day. Am I, am, am I the best I can be? Probably not. But I know I'll never be the best I can be until I'm standing in the glory of the Lord up there holding hands with Him before the throne. You know, I said this kind of last week. I talked about it a little bit, you know, but it, it, it's hard for me sometimes to wrap around how a king was sent to this world to die for me. A king. He came here to die for anybody that wants him. All they have to do is reach out and ask for him. There will always be struggle and perfection. There will always be somebody that will justify perfection. And I'll tell you what, we, we, we're seeing it right now in our government. These guys are struggling and trying to justify what their agenda is for our lives. That's a hard thing to swallow. Jesus said to the Pharisees, he says, you are the ones who justify yourselves in the eyes of men, but God knows your heart. What is highly valued among men is detestable to God's sight. It's 
detestable. God can't stand it when man tries to make perfect. He won't honor it. If you stand pleading to God in your prayer at 8 o'clock, you stand there, God, I've got to have a new car. Please give me a new car. Stand there and beg him. He stood for it. He's not going to listen to a beg. He wants to know what he did for you that day and thank him for what you are. And you're standing upright walking and breathing the air, man. You're breathing the air that he furnished for you to breathe. You're living the life he furnished for you to live. Isn't that enough? Can't you love him for that? God always, you know, just like in the, the prodigal son, I love that story. Because you know what? God always runs to the people that are willing to, to repent and to return home. No matter how bad the situation is and how desperate you are, he'll always run to you when you need him. And all the stuff that's going on right now in this country, you know, people, people are seeing that, that God's working. You know, I don't, I'm not much, I, I, hate, I hate to really bring up a lot of politics in, in church and behind this pulpit. You know what, though? I really prayed about them gun laws. And they shot him down this week, baby. Amen to that. They shot it down. That's how powerful God is. He works in Washington, D.C., too. Right now, God wants your imperfect world to be lived in him. And, you know, today, it's, uh, it might be a day that you're crying out for God. You're crying out to Jesus Christ. He wants you to step out on faith. He wants you to step out on, on, on the Word of God. It may be the, the perfection that you need, but, it, but it, according to this Bible, if you read these words, these are, these, this is the perfect life. This is the perfect leader. This is the perfect way, truth, and the life. He wants you to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to be, be with Him and let Jesus be your perfect one. I am, uh, you know, I, I've dealt with a lot of imperfect people in my life, including myself. But um, I've taken in over the years a lot of kids and helped them, and, and uh, my heart's always kind of fell for teenagers that needed help. And, and uh, there was one kid that his name was Brandon. And uh, Brandon Sherman. And Brandon was a kid that uh, I hired off the street. He was he he had uh, watched a man kill his dad in his living room, and his mother was in prison for drugs, and he was out on the street, didn't have anything. And I hired him, and uh, and I was always kind of a sucker for that. And I got took a few times, you know. Some of them guys they they stole from me, uh, this kind of thing. But this this kid wanted to work, wanted to be a bull rider. And I had some bulls at the time, and, and uh, just just come to fact, he became a, a good bull rider. And uh, he got on a PBR tour in uh, in Mexico. They had a big PBR tour in Mexico. He went on that tour, and uh, he was saved at a bull ride. And when he was saved, I called a I called a, a pastor that I knew real well in town at a at a Baptist church, and I told him about what happened. And I said I need to baptize this kid Sunday. So I walked into the church, and uh, Brother Grady there uh, had him up there in the baptistry, and he was fixing to dip him, and I, I, got, well, I walked up to the pulpit, and I, I was telling this kid's testimony. And uh, there's about 800 people standing out here. And they dipped him. You know, nobody clapped. Nobody cared. They didn't want that kid there. They didn't want him there. I could tell it. I felt it. We got through, Brother Grady brought him down, and the pastor had tears in his eyes. He said, man, I'm sorry. I said, well, I said, he's baptized, and he's saved. That's all that matters. Well, we left that church, and he came to see me about every three or four months when he came in. He was on that tour, and he was riding bulls, and he was working. And, but every time he seen me, he said one well, thing. First, before we ever got started, he said, man, I never forget it. I never forget the Lord. I know he's always with me. Well, I hadn't seen him in a long time, and I was writing a sermon one night, and I wrote a sermon about him. It was on a Wednesday night. I'm sitting there writing a sermon about Brandon. And um, I did about half of it. 
Next day, I went to work. That night, that, that next Thursday night, I'm sitting out on my porch. I, I finished the sermon about Brandon. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. I hadn't seen Brandon in six, eight months. Ten minutes after I finished the sermon, my wife walks out there and hands me the phone. And Brandon got the car and was killed that night. Do you believe that? You know what? God let me know that, that his perfected grace, through his perfected grace, that boy is in heaven. I had to change, I had to change the ending to that, to that, you know what no. It was almost hard for me to believe. But you know what? That's how that's how God works. God saved that boy's soul. I'll see him again in heaven. I'll bring his feet, his pain. He's probably getting on something every night up there. So, anyway. I've got one more story for you. This guy was a real close friend of mine. Uh, he was just driving a dump truck. What he does every day. He called me. Told me how great the Lord was working in his life. He was talking about God. He was talking about he was going to a new church, how well the church was doing, how well everything his life was doing. And the, the phone, like any other <laughs> cell phone, you know, he was clicking in and out. And he said, look, man, I'm getting bad. I, I can't hear but every other word. He said, I'll call you back when I get somewhere good. Well, Ten minutes after he hung up from me, he had a heart attack. Rolled that truck off in the trees. They found him down there and had a heart attack. He found somewhere good. You know, guys, and that, that's perfection. Every time I think about all these stories in my life, all these people, that's perfection. God's perfection is standing in the glory of God, holding hands, walking the streets of gold. That's perfection. That's how much God loves you. That's why he sent Jesus, so we can have that perfection. As they play this song, guys, I don't want to take away anything that you're doing in your life that is going to make your life any better. But I just want you to put Jesus in it so he can be your perfection. He can move you forward in a life that you might never felt. That day might be a day you might think about accepting Jesus if you haven't. If you already have, it may be a while you might want to rededicate yourself to find out where you're at today.